introducing uh, um, Aaron uh, for the sake of time. In, I think um, Aaron is one of the most prominent researchers of all of computer science in this generation. <laughs> <laughs> so, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I, I put quite a few qualifiers, but I think <laughs> that what I said is right. And he's really working on the 21st century issues of uh, computer science and artificial intelligence, starting from privacy, ethics, and fairness. And he is an authority of all of this subject. Uh, as far as a theoretical and algorithmic point of view is considered, he has co-authored two books, uh, one on differential privacy, which has been adapted as textbook in various courses in privacy. And uh, there is a recent book we co-authored with Michael Kahn's on, it's not so recent, but like, I think last year, right? Uh, so the ethical algorithm. Uh, Aaron has won numerous awards and uh, most prominently the PKS award from President Obama and the Sloan, uh, Sloan Fellowship, the NSF Career Awards, to name a few. Um, he is a professor of computer and information sciences in UPenn. Uh, he is Henry Salvatore Professor of Computer and Cognitive Sciences in that department. He's, he also has a secondary appointment in, um, in, the, in the stats department in Wharton School. So without, uh, without any further delay, we, have, we are extremely happy to introduce you, Aaron. The floor is all yours. The virtual floor is yours. Thanks. Yeah, glad to virtually be here. Um, and, and the stuff I'm going to talk about is, is from a set of three papers that are authored by subsets and supersets of the people on the slide here, in particular, uh, my, my faculty colleague, Osbert, and my students and former students, uh, Varun, Chris, George, and Ramya. Uh, actually, they're all students, current students, except for Chris, who, who has moved on uh, to Stanford. And so um, I want to talk about uncertainty quantification. And so I want to start by maybe observing that at this point, we've got all sorts of good methods for making point predictions, by which I mean machine learning has gotten really good. We can train deep neural networks and uh, they, they make decisions about um, you know, the, the labels of, of various examples. And for the most part, the decisions are right. Um, but they're not all right. I mean, we don't get like 100% accuracy. And so the question I want to ask is which specific predictions should we feel confident in and which ones maybe should we um, have less confidence in? Can we get some insight into where these models are going to make mistakes? And that's particularly important if we're going to take sort of, if we're going to take these predictions and try to make, um, you know, high impact decisions as a function of them. So maybe thinking about um, predictions in you know, predictive medicine maybe is a good, um, a good mental model here. We're making predictions, but we're going to make decisions based on those predictions that are impactful for particular people. And so we really would like to know, even if the model generally works, you, you know, um, on average over everybody, on which people should we feel less confident in the prediction? Now, there's all sorts of ways of quantifying uncertainty. But a, a particularly nice uh, one that I'd like to focus on in this talk is um, prediction sets. So rather than giving a point prediction, uh, like rather than saying um, this image on the right uh, is, a, is like definitely a marmot, I might say, um, you know, look, I'm not sure what this animal is on the right, but I'm pretty sure it's, you know, a marmot or a fox squirrel or a mink or a weasel or a beaver or a polecat. Okay, so rather than making a point prediction, a prediction set gives a, a set of labels. And hopefully the semantics of the prediction set are that with some um, target confidence, like 95%, the true label falls within that set. Okay, so prediction sets quantify uncertainty in two ways. One is just through the, um, the size of the set, right? If the, if the set is very small, if it's a singleton, for example, like the image on the right, I might say it's a, definitely a fox squirrel. Um, you know, that gives us some degree on sort of the quantitative nature of our uncertainty, right? So, you know, like if we're uncertain, but our uncertainty is spread between a lot of labels, um, 
you know, that's in some sense more uncertainty than if our uncertainty is spread between sort of like two labels. But more than that, because it actually, you know, the labels, um, it, or the prediction set contains specific labels. It tells us where our, our uncertainty lies. So it might be that, you know, I'm not sure if this animal is a marmot or a fox squirrel or a mink or a weasel, but, you know, it might be that for all of these labels, the action I want to take downstream is the same, like apply the brakes. Okay, so, so it might be that although we have a high degree of uncertainty given our label set, the uncertainty we have might actually not be relevant for the decision task we have. Okay, so, so prediction sets can give us like that kind of information as well. Okay, so the image on the left are like examples of prediction sets for like a classification problem, uh, but this makes perfect sense also for regression problems. For a regression problem, a prediction set is typically an interval. Okay, now, these prediction sets should mean something. And so the goal when we come up with prediction sets is that the thing they should mean is that they should contain the true label with uh, say 95% probability. Okay, we have some target confidence. We'd like it to contain the true label with that probability. And what that probability is taken over is something I'm gonna interrogate over the course of the talk. For now, I'll leave it unspecified. So let me tell you about conformal prediction, which is a technique that's been around for a while. It's due to Schaefer and Wolf. It's become trendy recently. Um, if you haven't heard of it, you know, let me give you like a, a one minute crash course. But roughly speaking, it's a very simple, elegant method to affix prediction sets to arbitrary black box models. Okay, so here's how it works. So I start with an arbitrary model for making point predictions. In this you know, running example, I'm gonna think of this as a regression model. So it takes as input a feature vector and it gives me a point prediction, which is just a number. But in general, conformal prediction makes perfect sense also for classification models. Okay, but the simplest case is a regression model. Then I pick what's called a non-conformity score, which maps uh, features and labels to sort of real numbers that are supposed to tell me roughly how surprising it would be if this example X had this label Y, where sort of bigger numbers correspond to like more surprise. Okay, so that's like what it's supposed to mean, but you can pick any non-conformity score you want and you know, you can just hope it has this meaning. So again, maybe sort of the simplest possible case here, you could pick any non-conformity score, but the simplest possible case to have in your mind is that if I have uh, some regression model that, predict, that makes point predictions F of X, then the non-conformity score given an example X and a candidate label Y hat would just be the absolute value difference between F of X, the label predicted by my model and Y hat. Okay, sort of meaning that um, labels that are closer to the prediction of my model are somehow less surprising to me if I believe the model and labels that are farther from the prediction of my model are somehow more surprising. Okay, but again, this is just an example. Everything we're gonna say holds for any non-conformity score. Okay, and then what do we do? Well, we take a holdout set. Hopefully it's been drawn IID from the same distribution on which we're gonna eventually deploy our model. And we look at the distribution of the non-conformity scores on the examples X uh, applied to their own labels Y. And what we'd like to find is a 95th percentile quantile of this non-conformity score distribution. Meaning we'd like to find some threshold such that empirically on our holdout set, 95% of the examples have non-conformity scores when evaluated on their own labels that are less than this threshold. And then what do we do? At test time on new examples, we produce prediction sets that um, are, are sort of the natural thing. We see our example X, okay? That lets us compute in particular, the prediction of our model F and the non-conformity score of X paired with any label. And our prediction set is just the set of all labels that when paired with um, X would have non-conformity score less than this threshold that we computed on the holdout set. Okay, so for example, in our, right, this is a prediction set that's defined for any non-conformity score. It makes sense in regression and classification problems, but in this running example where our model is a regression model and our non-conformity score is just the absolute value difference to the prediction. This corresponds just to the prediction interval centered at our prediction f of x that has width equal to twice the, the threshold tau. And it's a couple of lines of algebra to prove that 
um, you know, if if the examples really are drawn IID from some distribution, then in fact the probability that the new label will, you know, that that, that on a new example x y, uh, the label will fall within our prediction set, it's ninety five percent because we've found a you know we found a ninety fifth percentile quantile of the nonconformity score distribution and the new examples drawn from exactly that distribution. Okay. Now, this is what's called a marginal guarantee because when we take this probability, it's a, it's a, the probability is over the randomness of every object that we've talked about so far. It's over the randomness of the label Y, but it's also over the randomness of the feature vector X. And in fact, it's also over the randomness of the holdout set. Okay. So, um, you know, that's great. Uh, the, the, very, the very nice thing about conformal prediction is that it is extremely simple, it is extremely general. You don't have to assume anything about the model. You don't have to assume anything about the non-conformity score um, and you, you have this guarantee. But like we might ask for more because these marginal guarantees are extremely weak. So, so let's think about that. So just to make things concrete, you know, suppose we're at the beginning of a pandemic and, and maybe people are coming into the hospital. Um, they've got, you know, feature vectors. Those are, you know, their medical records, their demographic information, any readings we've taken about them at this visit. And we'd like to predict something like what is the probability or what is the sort of, um, what do we think their blood oxygen level is going to be in, in 24 hours time? Okay, maybe we're going to use these predictions to make decisions like should we, um, admit them to the ER or the ICU, you know, should we um, use scarce medical resources to treat this person? Okay, so our patient, you know, comes into the doctor's office, says, okay, given your, and the doctor says, given your features X, you know, I've got this regression model, it predicts that your blood oxygen level in 24 hours is going to be something, F of X. And the patient asks, how sure are you? You know, we're about to make an important decision based on this prediction. And maybe the doctor says, um, well, you know, I've, I've just learned about conformal prediction. I've got a 95% prediction interval um, that your blood oxygen level will be within some range between L of X and U of X. And so what does this mean for our patient? So if our patient was gonna try to, um, you know, use classical decision theory, say, to decide what she should do as a function of this probabilistic estimate, what she would really hope that this prediction interval meant was the following. She would hope that this prediction interval said her label as an individual would fall within this interval 95% of the time. Then she could sort of somehow use this information um, to make to make a decision about her. Okay, okay, so so that is she's hoping that this probability is conditioning on everything the doctor knows about her conditioning on all of her features. And then, you know, okay, what is the randomness taken over? Well, there's a whole literature and philosophy about this. It's not clear, but, you know, somehow maybe you could think about it as being taken over the unrealized or unmeasured randomness of the world, conditional on everything we've observed. Okay, now, now this is not what conformal prediction promises. And if you think about it, you know, you can convince yourself it's sort of impossible and possibly not even well-defined to talk about this quantity. Um, what conformal prediction promises is this other thing, a marginal guarantee, which you know um, syntactically looks very similar, but semantically is quite different. It says that on average, over all of the people for whom we make predictions, for 95% of those people, their label is contained within the interval we give. Okay, a marginal guarantee is averaging over people, whereas a conditional guarantee is a prediction for a particular person. So remember our doctor has said, there's a 95% prediction interval that our patient's blood oxygen level is between L of X and U of X. Our patient could think to herself, hmm, you know, I'm part of some demographic group that represents less than 5% of the population. It might be medically relevant. It is consistent with the guarantees of a marginal prediction interval that the model is wrong 100% of the time for our patients and even you know, that it's wrong 100% of the time for everybody who shares, you know, this medically relevant demographic characteristic, characteristic right? Like it might, a 95% marginal prediction interval means the model fails to cover the label for 5% of people. It does not say that those 5% of people are uniformly spread throughout the population. It might always fail to cover the label for some demographic group, 
that has size 5% and never failed to cover the label for everybody else. Okay, like the, the semantics of a marginal prediction interval don't disambiguate these two cases for us. Okay, now if, if all of these sort of relevant groups were sort of disjoint parts of the population, we could just sort of um, separately calibrate our models for each of them, right? Like we could just run conformal prediction separately on uh, each group and we'd be done. But when, and I think this is the common case, when the groups we're interested in um, overlap, then it, it's not so clear what to do. So for example, suppose our patient asks, well, okay, you know, that's a marginal guarantee, but like, what about for people like me? Well, the question is, what, what does that mean? What about people like me? So the doctor might flip through her medical journal and she might say, okay, well, for African-Americans under the age of 50, the 95% prediction intervals from A to B. And for women with a family history of diabetes, the 95% prediction intervals from C to D. And for people with egg allergies and no history of smoking, the 95% prediction intervals from E to F. Now, these groups are not mutually exclusive. Our patient might be a member of all of these groups. And remember, consistent with a marginal prediction interval might be the situation in which the interval A to B is entirely disjoint from the interval E to F, right? So, so like what is our patient to make of, of this you know, information? She says, okay, for each of these groups, you know, I basically have a different prediction. The predictions could be contradictory and yet you know, I might be a member of all of these groups. What am I supposed to do? Okay, so this is sort of um, maybe getting at the problem that, that one of the problems we'd like to solve. Okay, um, so, so this so, is- uh, of... Aaron, a quick nice yeah. question. Mm -hmm. uh, can we not use all uh, this, this as features, like this properties or this groups, the group identities as features for the problem? You certainly could. The question is, how do you do that to get uh, to get guarantees for each of the groups? R right. So, so it, it, you know, like the models that we're applying um, here might take as input, you know, these features. Nevertheless, like this sort of conformal prediction procedure I've described to you um, won't be able to make promises. Um, so, sort of conditional on groups, mm -hmm. right? Um, but okay. yes, okay. like somehow we need to figure out how to use these features. Um, ask another question. Yes. Uh, this is Armin Schwartzman here. In the classical regression setting, which is where you started, nothing on formal prediction, just a classical regression. Uh, you can produce uh, simultaneous or, or not even simultaneous, just you can produce confidence intervals for the prediction or even or prediction intervals simply by adding the reducible error to it. And that's conditional on the features because that's how the regression is set up. So how is this different from- Oh, good. Setting? So um, good. So, so this is, I, I'd like to do things without making parametric assumptions. So you're absolutely right that if I assume, for example, that the world is linear, that sort of the expectation of y is, you know, theta dot x, then what I can do is I can try to infer the parameter, the unknown parameters of the model. And to the extent that, my, you know, the model is well specified, I can get um, these true conditional uh, uncertainty estimates. The problem is if the model is not well specified, like, and I would assert that it almost always isn't, even if it's sort of convenient to, you know, derive linear regression, say, under the assumption that it is, those prediction intervals are no longer correct. Uh -huh. even, it, even if uh, there were no parameter regression that is regularized in some way. Even That's though... right. And, you know, if you think about it, we can talk about this afterwards. Like, this is for, for fundamental reasons. If what you want is this first thing and you're not making parametric assumptions, this is possible. This is impossible. Right, like I can, I, it, it's just not, um, you know, these individual probabilities are not well specified. I can write down two models for the world that are observationally indistinguishable, such that individual probabilities are sort of maximally different. So just from data, unless you make parametric assumptions, um, it's impossible to infer quantities like this. Thank you. 
Uh, but it's a good point that like if you're willing to assume the world is linear or or make parametric assumptions of of other of other kinds, uh, then you can then you can within the model at least get true conditional uh, uncertainty estimates. Okay. Um, okay. So there's another like assumption here in, in sort of what I've described so far, which is that you know we we sort of talked about this holdout set. Um, you know we we talked about the data being. IID and and drawn from the same distribution in our holdout set um, and, and at test time. Actually, you don't need IID. It's enough that it's exchangeable. But basically, you need to assume that the future has to look like the past, which is very convenient, but often not true. Um, you know, so for example, in our like pandemic uh, example, like as the disease moves through the population, you know, the demographics of your patients might change. Like initially, it's you know, young professionals flying back from Europe, then it's essential workers, the, you know, as, as um, treatments improve, the relationship between the features and the labels might change. This all might happen in unexpected ways. You know, there's time series data. Um, here, here's a cartoon whose punchline I will, I will ruin to you by explaining to you the joke. Uh, the joke is that the sequence of your, um, Christmas gift wishes to Santa does not form an exchangeable distribution. Okay. So our goal is to mitigate both of these problems, or you know, at least some of them. I'm, I'm going to talk to you about several papers. Um, in in both settings, we'd like to make stronger than marginal guarantees. Okay. And in one of the results I'm going to tell you about, um, I'd like to do so even when assuming nothing at all about the data. In, a, in sort of a in an adversarial setting, so I'm going to describe two sets of results. In both of them, we're going to make stronger than marginal guarantees in ways I'll tell you about. Um, in one of them, we will still assume that the data is exchangeable, that the future looks like the past. Uh, in the other, we won't. Okay, so you know, I gave you this crash course in uh, conformal regression where sorry, conformal prediction, where we had this very simple non-conformity score. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole cottage industry of coming up with different and better non-conformity scores that I won't tell you about, but just to sort of point out, you know, there's, people come up with non-conformity scores based on quantile regression. Um, for classification problems, people come up with non-conformity scores that sort of use the softmax outputs of a, of a neural network. Um, the nice thing about conformal regression is that it works for any non-conformity score. Uh, a lot of the sort of art to getting it to work well that we've seen in the last few years has been designing good ones, and we're going to inherit all of that. So we want to sort of talk about techniques that also can take as input arbitrary non-conformity scores. So, so like, what is it about non-conformity scores that make it, you know, so that, that are so convenient for, for studying prediction intervals? Well, think about like a, a classification problem where, where there's sort of k labels, a multi-class classification problem. There's two to the k possible prediction sets you could come up with, one for every subset of labels. So there's sort of this curse of dimensionality. Uh, what a non-conformity score does is it gives you this sort of natural one-dimensional parametric family of nested prediction sets. It's just the sets that can be specified as follows. Um, all of the labels that when paired with this example would give you a non-conformity score less than some threshold tau. Okay, so what a non-conformity score does is it sort of takes you from this sort of combinatorially large space of all prediction sets and lets you work in this sort of one dimensional space of prediction sets par par parametrized by thresholds on the non-conformity score. And so like, that's why we don't care what the non-conformity score is. Like, no matter what the non-conformity score is, our goal, basically, is to predict uh, one-dimensional prediction intervals from zero to tau that cover the non-conformity score 95% of the time. Or, or basically, we need to figure out, basically, quantiles of the non-conformity score distribution. Okay, so... Uh, in this sort of split conformal prediction method I, I told you about briefly early on in the talk, the idea was to pick a like a single threshold. And for every example x, we were going to produce a prediction set by, by considering all of the labels that when paired with this example would produce a nonconformity score less than a single threshold. 
It was the same threshold applied to all examples. Now, our goal here is to give stronger than marginal guarantees. And so we're gonna have to um, not just have a single threshold, the threshold we use is gonna have to depend on the examples and uh, we'll call the function that we come up with mapping examples to thresholds F. Okay, so we're gonna try to learn some function F that will produce um, prediction sets that have the following parametric form. On an example X, our prediction set will consist of all labels whose non-conformity score when paired with X is less than F of X. Okay, it's less than this threshold that depends on X. Okay. So, um, I, I told you I wanna give prediction sets that offer stronger than marginal guarantees. They're gonna be stronger than marginal in two ways. So let me tell you first uh, individually what each of those two ways are, and then I'll, I'll tell you what our final guarantee is, which sort of combines them. So let's think maybe for a moment about weather forecasting. Okay, so, so you like turn on the TV in the morning and then there's this weather forecaster who says, you know, that she, uh, you know, knows the mind of God. You know, what happened is, um, you know, every morning, like God calls her up on the phone and, and says what she's going to do is flip a coin that has some bias P and she's going to make it rain uh, exactly when the coin comes up heads. And the weather forecaster says that's where she's coming up with her forecasts from. Okay, when she says there's a 20% chance of rain, like there really truly is a 20% chance of rain over the randomness of, of God's coin flips, similarly 30%, 40%. Okay, you are skeptical of this and you would like to figure out a way to like test this weather forecaster, subject her to a hypothesis test um, that will at least some, you know, that, that such that she'll pass the test if really she has this direct line to God, but such that, um, you know, there should at least be some circumstances that reject the null hypothesis that, that she, you know, speaks to God every morning. Okay, so, so what could you do? Well, maybe the sort of simplest test is you could just look over time and um, average the predictions that she made, you know, on yeah, Monday, she predicted a 25% you know, chance of rain. On Tuesday, she predicted a 15% chance of rain, so on and so forth. Uh, average the predictions over time. And then also average the frequency of rain over time, and then like reject the null hypothesis if those if those two numbers are substantially different. If the average of her predictions is, is too different than the average of the propensity of rain. Okay, so, so this is a, a very simple test and it's also sort of too simple. It's too easy to pass. One way to pass this test would be for the weather forecaster every day to just predict what happened yesterday. If it rained yesterday, she predicts 100% chance of rain today. If it didn't rain yesterday, she predicts a 0% chance of rain today. You know, her, her forecasts are just like off by one from the outcome. And so the average of her forecasts is very close to the average of the outcome. Now it would be easy to catch this uh, weather forecaster out in a lie because frequently when she said there was 100% chance of rain, it wouldn't rain. And so this is what calibration is. Calibration says, okay, Let's look at all of the days for which she predicted a 60% chance of rain. On that subset of days, it should have rained 60% of the time. Let's look at all of the days on which she predicted a 20% chance of rain. On that subset of days, it should have rained 20% of the time. Right, it's asking that the predictions be correct, um, conditional on the prediction itself. And we can ask for that too. Okay, we can ask that our prediction sets um, be what's called, what we call threshold calibrated, meaning that the probability that, the that a new label is contained in the prediction set for a new example uh, should be what we want it to be, 95%. Uh, also conditionally conditioning on the value of uh, the threshold we're using for that example, f of x. Okay, here's something else we might want, uh, which we call group conditional validity. So suppose we divide up uh, people into a bunch of different demographic groups that maybe we think are medically relevant or otherwise relevant to the prediction, like these demographic groups that we sort of talked about in our cartoon. And remember, what was interesting about this grouping uh, was that our patient fell into many of the groups, right? These groups were not um, disjoint, they, they intersected. So let's imagine that that's true for our collection of groups as well. 
Okay, so for example, maybe we have divisions based on uh, shape. So we have triangles and circles and squares and stars, uh, but also we have divisions based on color. We have blue uh, shapes and green shapes and red shapes. And also we have divisions based on, you know, whether you're glowing or not. Uh, Right, a single a single object here can be a, a member of, of many of these groups. So we'll say that um, our prediction sets satisfy group conditional coverage with respect to some set of groups. If for every group in the set, the probability that um, the probability that the label falls within the prediction set is what we want it to be, ninety five percent. Uh, not just marginally, but even conditionally on membership in that group. We want this to hold simultaneously for all of the groups, even though they're not disjoint, right? So for example, going back to our um, yeah, medical example here, uh, we wanna be able to give a single prediction interval for our patient, not three different different prediction intervals. You know, she's one person, we wanna give her a single prediction interval, but we want it to have the desired semantics that it covers 95% of the labels averaged over each of these groups simultaneously over each of these groups. And so it should be correct under sort of the interpretation that our patient is a uniformly random member of any one of these groups, whichever of these groups she decides to sort of consider herself a, a member of, um, right? All of these interpretations should be simultaneously correct. Okay, so that's what we call group conditional coverage. And then we can combine these things, which we call prediction set multi-validity, which is just basically, you know, um, not, you know, that we want to be able to condition on group membership and the threshold value at the same time. Okay, so prediction set multi-validity is what we have if our prediction sets um, cover the label with their target probability, 95% not just marginally, but conditional on being a member of any one of these groups and conditional on using any particular threshold. So we can condition both on the threshold we use, that's the calibration condition, and we can condition on group membership, that's the group conditional guarantee, and conditioning on both of these things should, you know, we should still have the target coverage probability, okay? All right, so um, maybe let me pause here because I've now told you what we want to do, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to do it, uh, but, but let me make sure we're on the same page about like what the goal is. So are, are, are there any questions about what we're trying to promise here with prediction set multi-validity? Initially, I'm going to be talking about the sort of distributional setting where there really is some distribution uh, and points are drawn IID from it. So um, let me show you three algorithms that have sort of guarantees that are that are increasingly strong. So, so here's maybe the, the sort of simplest algorithm in the and we're asking the least from it. Okay, so um, first of all, there is a distribution. Okay, we're not yet in this adversarial setting. So points are drawn IID from some distribution. And what I'd like is I'd like group conditional coverage but I'm not going to worry about threshold calibration yet. Okay, so I just want coverage conditional on group membership. I don't, I'm not going to worry about um, threshold calibration. Okay, the, the algorithm is, is extremely simple. All I am going to do is I am going to uh, find a model in a very simple class. The class is just linear combinations over um, the indicator functions for the groups that I want group conditional coverage for. So I'm just optimizing over linear combinations of the indicator functions that indicate membership in each of the groups that, I'm, that, that I'd like group conditional coverage for. And what am I optimizing? I'm optimizing a simple convex objective function that's called pinball loss, okay, which is really just like, you know, absolute loss, but potentially tilted. So um, just to maybe give you some little bit of intuition, Absolute loss is what's called like a proper scoring rule for the median, by which I mean, if I try to find the number that minimizes absolute loss um, in expectation over a label drawn from some label distribution, then the number that will minimize the loss is the median of the label distribution. 
Now, uh, it turns out there's nothing special about the median. The median is the 50th percentile quantile. If, if you take the absolute loss and you tilt it one way or the other, um, it starts being called pinball loss. And depending on the tilt, you can rig things up so that the minimizer of this loss function is uh, any quantile of the distribution that you want. Okay, so we're just minimizing this sort of um, loss function, which is like a proper scoring rule for, for quantiles, uh, crucially over linear combinations of the group indicator function. And um, the theorem that you get when you do that is that uh, no matter what the distribution is, no matter what your set of groups uh, are, if you exactly minimize this quantity, here I'm giving you the theorem for if you exactly minimize it over the distribution, but you can give you know, sort of good finite sample bounds using standard generalization kinds of arguments. Um, then the model output, think of this as remember the model that is mapping examples to thresholds on some non-conformity score. The model output will satisfy group conditional coverage with respect to um, this class of models G. And uh, although I won't have time to like go through the formal proof, maybe like some intuition for why this is, Suppose it were not the case. Okay, suppose there was some group such that conditional on membership in that group, uh, you were, you know, you, you were actually covering the label only 90% of the time, not 95% of the time. Well, what I could do is I could imagine fixing things for that group. I could sort of, for members of that group, start shifting my prediction upward only for members of that group until I covered their label 95% of the time. Well, it turns out that if I were to do that, I would decrease pinball loss and I would stay within the model class over which I'm optimizing because shifting the prediction up for members of that group corresponds exactly to increasing the weight uh, in, in my linear combination on the group indicator function for that group. But, but that can't happen because I've found the global minimum for pinball loss over this model class, right? So it can't be that I can decrease the loss um, while staying within the model class. And the result of that is that I must satisfy group conditional coverage. Okay, how about if I want um, not just group conditional coverage, but, but the, the full guarantee of multi-validity, which means simultaneous group conditional coverage and threshold calibration. Well, now there's not a one-shot algorithm anymore. Oh, and we're still in the distributional setting. The, the data is drawn IID from some distribution. Okay, so, so now, there's not a one-shot algorithm anymore, but we've got this iterative algorithm that is again, very simple and intuitive. Okay, at any given moment, it has some candidate function, FT, that we hope is multi-valid, meaning, meaning sort of we hope that conditional on membership in any group and conditional on any threshold, we cover the label, you know, conditional on that group and that threshold 95% of the time. Now, if that's far from being true, then there must be some particular group and some particular threshold such that if we zoom in, if we condition on membership in that group and getting a prediction of that threshold, that we are sort of badly um, marginally miscovering, meaning we cover the label 90% of the time instead of 95%. So again, we just consider sort of patching the model by, by fixing it, like basically shifting the model predictions upwards or downwards conditional on that group and on that threshold um, so that so that we get 95% coverage in this one spot. Now, the, the concern for an algorithm like this is that we've sort of patched things and made them better in one place, but maybe we've made them worse elsewhere. But again, you can show that patching the model in this way reduces pinball loss. And, and so uh, pinball loss serves as a potential function and you can't, you can't cycle. And so in particular, what you can show is that for any approximation uh, term alpha that you that you want to plug this plug into this algorithm, this algorithm will run quickly for one over alpha squared many iterations, and it will output a model that satisfies alpha approximate multivalid coverage with respect to this uh, class G, which again means now that we're getting simultaneous group conditional coverage and threshold uh, calibrated coverage. Okay, so that was the batch setting. Let me now, uh, okay, and, and so, so we get these sort of stronger than marginal guarantees, uh, but we still needed to assume that the future looks like the past. Like we've, you know, like when, when you sort of prove generalization bounds here, 
you know, you're really uh, running this on some data sets and, you know, the, the theorem you have is for the underlying distribution, which means you get coverage on new data exactly when it is like drawn from the underlying distribution. But like, okay, suppose we're worried that the distribution might, might be changing. We can, in this case, think instead about sort of a more difficult setting, uh, which is sort of the online sequential prediction problem against an adversary. So here's how it works. Um, time now proceeds in rounds from days one through capital T. At each round, the adversary selects a feature vector and uh, maybe a label, but only shows the learner the feature vector. Now, um, the learner gets to choose some threshold you know, tau that might be different on different days, which corresponds to a prediction set. Again, the set of predictions that um, you know, have non-conformity score uh, less than, the, than this threshold tau. The non-conformity score here, by the way, can also be um, changing in an adversarial way from day to day. And only then does the adversary reveal the label, and in particular, the learner figures out whether she's covered the label or not and, and learns the non-conformity score for the true label. And our goal is that even though there's no distribution here, right, the adversary might be choosing examples in some arbitrary way, sort of, you know, with the only goal perhaps being of screwing up the learner. The goal is that, you know, as we, as we play, we generate some transcript, some record capital T of um, examples X and, and prediction sets and, and labels Y. And what we would like is that in hindsight on the empirical distribution defined by the transcript, we should satisfy multi-valid coverage, which just means, you know, in hindsight, when we zoom in on those subset of days uh, that correspond to examples that are members of, of one of the groups that we care about, and also that correspond to us using some particular threshold that we should have covered 95% of the labels even on that subset of days. Okay. So this is a, a difficult model to work in. Of course, we don't really imagine that the world is adversarial, but the merit of working in an adversarial setting is that since you haven't made any assumptions, you don't have to worry about those assumptions uh, being false um, you know, when, you, when you deploy your model in practice. And so if the, you know, and so in particular, it handles distribution shift of um, you know, more natural sorts, even if it is unexpected and unpredicted. So let me give you just a little bit of idea of how you would uh, think about, you know, maybe deriving an algorithm for this problem. So, so basically, we need to measure something. We need to we need to sort of figure out a good way of measuring our progress. Um, and remember that what multi-valid coverage asks for is basically a condition that holds for each group S and for each threshold tau. Okay, and what is that condition? It's just that when I average over all of the examples from this group for which I use this threshold tau, um, the, the empirical frequency with which I cover the example, meaning the empirical frequency uh, with respect to which the non-conformity score on that example was less than the threshold, should converge to my target frequency, 95%. So that's exactly this sort of V quantity here that I've written down, parametrized by a group S and a threshold tau, um, perfect multi-validity would correspond to these V quantities equaling zero for every uh, group S and threshold tau. And our goal, you know, of course we can't get them to uh, equal exactly zero, but our goal is going to try to be um, that sort of, you know, against an adversary, no matter what sequence we see, these V quantities should go to zero at a rate of uh, one over the square root of the number of examples that they're averaging over. So one over the square root of the number of examples of days that were in group S for which we predicted threshold T, which is sort of the statistically optimal rate. This is the rate at which you would expect just due to sort of law of large numbers kind of variation that our uh, empirical, um, coverage frequency would converge to its target, even if we had the perfect coverage frequency on the underlying distribution. So the basic idea is there's this thing we want to bound, 
like the the maximum overall thresholds and and groups s of, of our loss which is like you know these these v quantities what is our empirical miscoverage rate um you know conditional on group s and threshold t uh, over the square root of the number of examples we've seen from group s and threshold t so we'd really like that our loss was bounded by something like one at the end of the day that would mean we'd succeeded now this quantity depends on the whole history it's kind of messy to think about and so we might instead think about trying to greedily bound the increase in loss right so so we, we might sort of say okay what's done is done um today i've seen a particular new example x so in particular i know what groups it's a member of i don't know what the label y is but you know for any particular label y now you know that'll lead to some some new loss tomorrow what i would like to do is i'd like to upper bound in the worst case over what y might be um the expected change in loss the expected increase in loss from uh from today to tomorrow where the expectation is over my own randomness i might be a randomized algorithm and so of course if we can bound for every history the expected increase in loss then just by telescoping we can bound the final loss okay and now let me remind you what a zero sum game is so you know you've all played rock paper scissors i imagine that's a zero sum game so more generally uh, a zero sum game is defined by a minimization player who has some strategy space a1 we will always identify the minimization player with the learner we've got a maximization player who will identify with the adversary who themselves has some strategy space and there's some utility function that maps um, an action of the learner and an action of the adversary to some real number and the learner would like to you know the learner would like things to play out so as to minimize this utility function and the adversary would like things to play out so as to maximize this utility function and uh, we can extend this to distributions in the natural way so i don't have to you know deterministically play rock in rock paper scissors i can randomize between rock and paper and scissors okay now the sort of the, the foundational facts about zero sum games this like really powerful thing uh, is it called von neumann's minmax theorem and, and what it means is that order of play doesn't matter okay so rock paper scissors is traditionally played as a simultaneous move game um but you know i could tell you my strategy up front i could say well look here's what i'm going to do i'm going to randomize uniformly between rock and paper and scissors and in a zero sum game um you know, in rock paper scissors doing so doesn't put me at a disadvantage right like you you're not able to exploit me anymore by knowing my strategy ahead of time okay or, or similarly you know if you are forced to announce your strategy ahead of time doesn't help okay like you know if we're both playing optimally no matter which one of us is forced to go first we're both gonna win you know a third of the time lose a third of the time and draw a third of the time um and, and that's what, what what von neumann's minmax theorem says is that that's true generally for zero-sum games it doesn't matter what the zero-sum game is if i want to think about how well i can do in a zero-sum game then it doesn't matter if i announce my strategy first or if my opponent announces their strategy first okay so let's define a game between the learner and the adversary where naturally uh, my strategy space here is the set of thresholds i might pick the adversary's strategy space is the set of labels they might pick or equivalently the set of non-conformity scores they might pick um, and the thing that i would like to minimize and the adversary would like to maximize is this quantity delta which is just the change in my loss function between today and tomorrow okay i'd like that to be small the adversary would like that to be large okay this is a zero sum game now what's really happening is that by needing to commit to an algorithm i am going first in this game right the algorithm is announcing to the adversary my strategy and because i require that i do well against any sort of sequence of examples the adversary might cook up you know i have to do well even if the adversary is best responding to my strategy which just means tailoring their sequence to the particular algorithm i came up with but um what von neumann's min max theorem tells us is that 
if I want to imagine how, if I want to think about how well it is, how well I can do in principle in this game, I can imagine what happens if the adversary goes first. And what does it mean for the adversary to go first? Well, it means the adversary is going to announce ahead of time to me, um, what is the distribution on labels they're going to sample from? Or equivalently, what is the distribution on non-conformity scores they're going to sample from? Now, it's sort of obvious that if the adversary goes first, I can do very well in this game because what I'm trying to do in getting 95% you know, coverage, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to predict the 95th sort of quantile, the 95th percentile of the adversary's distribution. But if they told me their distribution, then I can just read that off of the CDF. So there's some sort of calculations to do, but maybe it's not so hard to convince yourself that if the adversary has to tell me their label distribution ahead of time, then it's very easy to get, you know, group conditional and threshold calibrated coverage. In fact, in this world, I'm really even getting, you know, fully conditional coverage because I know the label distribution for, for sort of each, for each person. And when you apply the min-max theorem, um, you know, what it tells you non-constructively is that there is some algorithm, there is some strategy for the learner that does just as well as this against a worst case uh, sequence of, uh, of examples and labels. Okay, so, so, so far this is a non-constructive argument. Let me just tell you the theorem that pops out of this, but then I'll show you the algorithm. Like you can actually derive the algorithm by computing the equilibrium of this game, and it turns out to be very simple. Okay, so first of all, what's the theorem? So, so from the minimax theorem, what you get um, sort of existentially is there must exist an algorithm parametrized by an arbitrary collection of groups. So it doesn't matter what the group structure is um, that can take as input any sequence of models, any sequence of nonconformity scores that can depend on past examples and any sequence of examples. All of that can be adversarially chosen. And the promise is that with probability one minus delta over the randomness of the algorithm conditional on the sequence, um, simultaneously, if I zoom in on any group uh, in my group structure and zoom in on any threshold that I might predict, that if I look at the empirical coverage conditional on being a member of that group and predicting that threshold, it differs from the, the target at a rate that goes to zero at the statistically optimal rate, at a rate of you know one over the square root of the number of people um, corresponding to that group and that threshold, which is the same rate at which it would go to zero if you actually knew the distribution um, and were predicting um, you know correct 95th percentile sort of quantiles over the underlying distribution. And the reason it's the statistically optimal rate is because you know, what the minimax theorem lets us do is analyze things as if we do know what the distribution is. Now, that was just an existential argument, but, you know, there's some work to do, but like basically you know what the algorithm must be. It must be the minimax equilibrium strategy for the learner in this game we defined, and you can work that out. And I, I'm just flashing it on the screen to show you that it's not very complicated. Like basically what happens is you see a new example, you look at what groups that example is a member of. You, for each of those groups, you compute for each threshold some number from the history, and you sum that number up over all of the groups this example is a member of, and then you do some algebra and you make a prediction. That's it. All right. Um, it's almost a deterministic algorithm, meaning although it is a randomized algorithm, it randomizes only between two thresholds that are you know, like within epsilon of one another for epsilon arbitrarily small. All right, so the nice thing about these algorithms is you can code them up and run them. They really work. They're very simple. Let me show you some plots. Um, okay, so first I'll show you plots for the sort of offline variants of these algorithms. So, so, so this is, you know, where there is a distribution here. And this is uh, census data coming from what's called the folk tables package. Um, but this is, you know, real census data uh, from California, hundreds of thousands of points. Um, it, it's an income prediction task. And groups here are defined by um, race, uh, sort of census defined race categories and binary gender. So you can be a member of, you, you know, like your race doesn't determine your gender. So, so these groups are intersecting. And, um, okay, so 
so I'm going to show you plots corresponding to sort of the two algorithms um, in the batch setting that I told you about today. One that sort of promises only group conditional coverage, the other of which promises full multi-valid coverage. And I'm going to compare that to sort of the two existing baselines from the literature. The first is like the naive baseline, which is just ignore the group structure and find the single threshold that gets 90% coverage marginally over all of the groups. The other is to separately calibrate on each of the groups. But what do you do now when you uh, find someone who's a member of multiple groups? Well, what you do is you use the more conservative of the thresholds corresponding to the groups that they're a member of. You take the maximum of the thresholds. Okay, so those are sort of the two things that exist in the literature before us. Um, and what do we see? Okay, so sort of unsurprisingly, uh, when you look at the, um, sort of the naive method that ignores the groups, that's the blue line, uh, on some groups it undercovers, on some groups it overcovers. These groups, you know, like it, like it does get 90% marginal coverage, but the errors, uh, just as in our cartoon, are not uniformly you know, spread throughout the population. There's undercoverage in some groups and overcoverage on others. When you look at the conservative approach that uses the maximum of the thresholds for any of the groups an individual is a member of, um, that's the purple line, you no longer get under coverage. Like you get the, at least the target coverage. It is a conservative approach, but sometimes you get over coverage. And then when you look at our two algorithms, uh, the sort of blue, the light blue one is the one that promises only group conditional coverage. And the green one is the one that promises full multi-valid coverage. Then we hit the target coverage rate um, everywhere. Uh, the one that promises only group conditional coverage actually is sort of like almost perfect. Like it's all, like really hugging this 90% line. You can see on group two, the one that promises multi-valid coverage. And, and remember, since it's an iterative algorithm, uh, it only gives approximate guarantees. Uh, you know, it's not quite perfect. It's like under covering there, um, you know, by like half a percent, but it's, it's still very good. Uh, and on the right, you can see sort of the prediction set sizes. And so uh, what you get, you know, in addition to getting like um, the right coverage rates, what you get is that, you know, on groups for which the, baseline methods were substantially over covering, like here you actually get uh, more informative predictions, like the prediction intervals are narrower, which is what you want. Okay, we can look at threshold calibration. And again, the baseline methods uh, generally do poorly, uh, you know, um, they didn't even get group conditional coverage right that you know they're they're sort of even worse for sort of threshold calibration on on the groups um the green line which is the line corresponding to our multi-valid method that actually has a theorem associated with it for threshold calibration not just group conditional coverage uh performs the best uh, unsurprisingly but maybe a little bit surprising is that um the, the light blue line, this is our algorithm that promises group conditional guarantees, also does like pretty well, better than all of the baselines, even though it has, even though it's not clear why it should, like it doesn't have a theorem associated with it for threshold calibration, but still it does well. All right, and finally we can, we can move to sort of the unanticipated distribution shift setting. Now we're using our online sequential algorithm. Same prediction task income from California census data. Um, but now what's happening is there's a distribution shift. So sort of there's training data, um, there's calibration data from California, but then all of a sudden examples start coming from Pennsylvania. Uh, so for the sort of split conformal methods, what we do is we uh, calibrate on California data and then we evaluate them on Pennsylvania data. Um, for our method, what we do is we, we run it on California data and then at some point we switch it to running it on Pennsylvania data. And we, you know, the, the method doesn't know when the switch is happening and we measure performance starting at the switch. So the performance is measured on the Pennsylvania data. And again, what we see is that sort of the, the sort of methods that are based on exchangeability that sort of can't, uh, aren't supposed to be able to account for this uh, kind of non-exchangeability miss their coverage target, uh, they get, in this case, they overcover, whereas we uh, are much closer to hitting the 90% coverage target and um, uh, 
you know, what we get uh, in addition to better coverage is uh, narrower prediction interval widths. So sort of more informative uncertainty estimates. Okay, thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, the work um, I described here sort of is in a series of three papers. Sort of some of the early theory was in ITCS at the very beginning of this year. Uh, the, the sort of online algorithm I described was, will be in, in NeurIPS at the end of this year. And the offline algorithms um, are from a paper that we just posted on archive. So thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, we are running like four minutes over time, but uh, assuming that uh, people have nowhere to go, if there is any question for Aaron, it would be a good time to ask. Um, okay, I'd like to ask a quick question. Uh, sure. Aaron, that was a great talk. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. So the question I had was that, um, I have the feeling that in some situations where you're doing these uh, confident predictions and so on, if you make a prediction um, about which you have high confidence, then you actually don't find out the label. I, I'm guessing that happens pretty often. For example, you know, you're doing credit card uh, transactions. If you're very sure that it's legitimate, then, you know, um, you know, the company doesn't bother uh, investigating and finding out whether it's legitimate or fraudulent. Yeah. So in those kinds of settings where, you know, um, where you don't necessarily find out the true label um, all the time, um, presumably things get harder. And I, I was wondering, like, well, what does one do in these cases? Is there some little bit of uh, exploration or something like that? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so like, first of all, th there's, it, there's two settings here, like in the sort of traditional, like exchangeable data setting, uh, you don't need labels at test time at all. But uh, of course, you assume that the data is, you know, like drawn from some fixed distribution. In the sequential setting, oh, oh and of course, there, there's sort of no hope to deal with distribution shift, uh, at least of the conditional label distribution, unless you know what it's going to be ahead of time, because you just don't get any feedback about it. Uh, in the sequential setting, um, as I've described it, but also it for, you know, there's several other papers in this setting, and I think this is true of all of them. It is sort of in the full information setting, meaning it is assumed that you get the label um, after you make the prediction, which is like sometimes true, like maybe for like stock prediction tasks, you see what the stocks did tomorrow, but um, you're right, is often not true. And I imagine you could try to use sort of, you know, contextual bandits like techniques to get around this, but as to, to my knowledge, it hasn't been done. So I think that's a great question. Like, can you do, you know, like bandit sequential conformal prediction? Um, you know, there's some chance it doesn't look that different from bandit optimization of other sorts, but but it hasn't been done. So, so I, I don't know. Okay, thanks. So, uh, so for the multi-valid case in, in, in bandits, you might not even see some of the groups for a very long time, or maybe you don't, so the, that, that would be a bit problematic, right? So I, I don't know. Yeah. How so remember like the, the error guarantee that we promise depends on how many examples we've seen from each group. Like the error goes to zero sort of at a rate of one over, not like one over the square root of the total number of examples, but one over the square root of no, the number of examples from that group, because otherwise you're right, it would be like impossible. Oh, um, but but you're right that sort of this is something that, that the sort of fine grained error guarantee is something that you don't generally see in banded algorithms and might complicate applying standard bandit techniques. Right. Um, okay. Any other question? Okay, so uh, let's thank Aaron one more time and end it here. And Aaron, we'll look forward to discuss this more with you in the upcoming meetings. All right. Thank uh, you. Thanks for having me.